at uh, 11.01. Well, welcome, everybody. And I want to welcome Rabbi Adler, of course, in, um, in Yerushalayim. And Rabbi Adler is the Rav of the Ohel Ol Nechama Shul in, in Katamon. He served for many years in, in Ramot. He served as a rabbi in Europe. And uh, he's had a, a long career um, in Israel, taught at Barlan University, the founder of uh, Yeshiva Bnei Akiva in Chashmo Naim. And uh, for our purposes, he served as the, the Shamish of the Rav, the Rav's, um, you, know, you know, special assistant in the uh, early 70s, I believe. And um, so he has a lot to say about Rav Soloveitchik, and it's a pleasure to welcome him to give a three-part series on re-experience Yom Kippur, the Rav's Yom Kippur. Anybody who's read about the Rav, how Yom Kippur was such a powerful day, and he got transformed. The the uh, the Beit Hamikdash while he davened on Yom Kippur and right if everybody can bring a Matzor and Rabbi Adler Vakasha. Thank you very much, Rabbi Kelman. Um, uh, with your uh, permission, one of our participants from Yerushalayim, um, Elaine Pomerantz, uh, I just mentioned that uh, this evening would be the uh, yurtzeit of her father, Shabtai Meir ben Avraham. So I'm dedicating the shir uh, in his memory on the 19th of Elul. The Rav and Yom Kippur, they go together. The Rav almost personified many, many aspects of what Yom Kippur was all about. In a word, when the Rav would develop a philosophical idea, something of what we call hashkafa, it would always begin with a discussion of some halakha. You would never realize at the outset what direction the Rav was taking but he would begin usually with some text of the Rambam, sometimes a discussion in the Gemara, and then branch out and develop the various philosophical ideas that he wanted to develop. On more than one occasion, the Rav said that the texts that are available for discussion of the oral law go way beyond the formal texts of Mishnah and Gemara and um, the various medieval greats, the Rishonim and Achonim, the world of responsible literature, the Sheilot to Chuvot, and so on, and all the commentaries. But the very, very Siddur that we use for daily davening, or the Machsar that we use for special occasions, are no less a text that can be understood, analyzed, in terms of their Torah Shabal the oral law import, and then one can extrapolate the many, many different ideas and take it into different directions. The Machsar of Yom Kippur for the Rav was an unbelievable text for this purpose. Several years ago, the, um, the OU in New York City uh, published a Machsar of the Rav's ideas on Rosh Hashanah and a second volume on Yom Kippur. So many of the shirim that the Rav gave in the course of nearly 50 years in different forums were culled together, uh, put together, uh, there were tapes, there were, there were notes, it was by memory and attached to the various uh, tefillot. So for a person sitting in shul uh, and going through these tefillot, one could somehow absorb some of the ideas that the Rav was uh, trying to convey. In this three-part series, we will tr uh, try to re-experience the Rav on three levels. Tonight, till we, tonight or this morning, 11 a.m. in Toronto, noontime, uh, we will deal with Kol Nidre experience. Next week, the Avodah, the Koin Gadol service in the Beit HaMikdash, and how that relates to us today without a Beit HaMikdash. And the third, perhaps, a, a, an exciting moment in the Rav's Yom Kippur experience, Mila, how Yom Kippur draws to a close. Um, in the um, volume of the Machsar of Yom Kippur, known as the Machsar Masora Tarav, the Rav's tradition of Yom Kippur, the introduction reads as follows. And this is a quote from a drasha that the Rav gave in 1976 that I had a big schut personally attending. And I would just say that the Rabbinical Council of America, the, known as the RCA, would sponsor an annual shiur before Yom Kippur. It was referred to as the Kinnis Tshuva, usually delivered in some large hotel auditorium that would have 
approximately 3,000 seats. And without exaggeration, the shiur went on for about four hours. And it was a, a nonstop flight. Uh, and and uh, it was just absolutely amazing. And in one of their particular, these shirim, the Rav said as follows, the shir was in Yiddish, but these things were translated into Hebrew, into English, and to French, and so on. He writes, or he said then, 1976, my religious worldview was formed not only through learning Torah, but also by my religious experience. I continually refer to two traditions of Torah learning, halakha, and that of religious life, and feeling and enthusiasm, the love of Hashem, the yearning for Hashem. The first is relatively easy to impart. I can present long lectures on shofar, on the halachot of tshuva, on the avodah, etc., with great depth and thoroughness. Yet what is easy for me regarding the first tradition is very difficult regarding the second. It is almost impossible to teach in the context of a classroom, a lecture, give over that emotion with the robot talk about himself as a child in the town Chaslovich, where his father, Rav Moshe Salavechik Zatzal, served as a town rabbi, and having spent some time in Brisk uh, with his grandfather, Rav Chaim Salavechik on Yom Kippur, and trying to describe some of his emotions and so on. This is, um, it, it somehow falls short when you just see it in words, but the Rav was trying anyway to give over these type of experiences. And to this end, we're going to see what we can understand from the um, experience of Kol Nidre. Uh, so we come to shul on the night of uh, the eve of Yom Kippur. Many people come about 15 minutes earlier so they can say a very, very long prayer, tefillah, called tefillah zakah, which we're not going to deal with now, but a very important tefillah. A, written by the author of the Chaye Adam. It's a tefillah that's almost 300 years old and certainly prepares somebody for the spirit of Yom Kippur. And then the Chazan begins with Kol Nidre. But he doesn't begin with Kol Nidre. He get, begins with a preamble. And he states, Al dat hamakom al dat hakahal b'yishiva shel ma'ala u'b'yishiva shel mata with permission, with the understanding and consent of a Kadosh Baruch Hu and the congregation, the people, with the Yeshiva Shalmala, whatever the heavenly court is, and Yeshiva Shalmata, that's the people here, but most probably related to the fact that we have assembled a type of Beit in at the moment of Kol Nidre, because we're dealing with a halacha called annulment of vows. And that is one of the reasons, perhaps the classic reason, why the chazan is um, surrounded by two individuals, both of them holding sifrei Torah, and we somehow create the impression as if it's a beit in, a court going on. So there's a heavenly court and there's the human court. And everybody is, is now uh, in sync with each other, together as a joint declaration, we are now going to issue a permissibility, a heter, to pray with those who are sinners. This is remarkably strange because sinners come to shul throughout the year and why on Yom Kippur would there be a need to introduce the davenings of Yom Kippur with some type of declaration that allows the inclusion of the Arvaryanim, those sinners. It is not actually an allowance. It's not a permissibility, but it's actually an indispensability. What is going on here, if you have a davening session going on throughout the year, and there are people who are not big tzaddikim who come to the tefillah, okay, so nobody's going to throw them out. But if you don't have such people, and you have your normal minion who are genuinely, let's say, Torah-observant Jews with integrity, a, so 
the davening is a davening. You 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 do your shacharit, you do your mincha, you do your mayrit, you do your musaf on Shabbat, and so on. Something about Yom Kippur that if we don't bring everybody into the fold, including those who perhaps you feel uncomfortable, a little agitated, that you're actually inviting them to come in. This is not for you. Davening is for people who understand that there's a Torah and there's a mitzvah and there's an experience of meeting God, lefnei Hashem titaru. Why would we need such a person to come to shul on Yom Kippur? And here the Rav dramatically explains the absolute necessity of having every single type of Jew in the, in the present, present in the Beit Knesset on Yom Kippur. Number one, there is a halakha that says, the Mishnah Gura actually quotes it, he said, in Hilchot Ror of Yom Kippur, kol tanit sibur, any public fast day, she'en bo mi poshei Yisrael, we don't have some sinners amongst the crowd there, e no tanit, it's not a bona fide fast day. Sharei chelbena, chelbena was one of the spices that was used in the concoction of the ktoret, the, uh, the offering of, uh, of, 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 uh, of smell that was done in the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple of the days of old. And this chelbena happened to have had a very, very, very awful uh, smell to it, reach ra. And yet, if you're missing this one particular ingredient, it's as if you, the, you have not fulfilled the obligation at all. There is a necessity to bring everybody into the picture. But the Rav cites a Rambam in the second chapter of the Laws of Tshuva, who says, Yom HaKippurim Huzman Tshuva Lakol, Layachid V'Rabim. Now, Tshuva, repentance, is not a Yom Kippur thing. It's throughout the year. Three times a day, we have a tefillah in Shmon Esrei. You can repent throughout the year. So the Rav spent many, many drashot explaining the difference between, the qualitative difference between tshuva throughout the year and the unique tshuva of Yom Kippur. And with regard to Yom Kippur, one vital point is, it's the zman tshuva lakol for everyone. Which doesn't only mean that everybody is cordially invited to partake. It means that everybody must necessarily partake. It's the end game of all atonement. And the Ramam says, therefore, everyone is obligated on Yom Kippur to go through the repentance the uh, stage and, and process. And to say the vidu can confession on Yom Kippur. So Rama makes a big to-do about this, that this is not just the rabbim, the multitudes, and not just a handful of people, but it's everybody. It's everybody. And the Rav goes further and he looks in the Machsa. And in the Machsa we say, lanu Hashem be'ava, God has given us at Yom Kippurim Hazeh, Lemechila. Now, those are three synonyms seeming uh, to say the same thing. To forgive, forgive, and forgive. But it's not exactly to forgive and forgive and forgive because sin comes in three packages. Chait, Avon, and Pesha. It has to do with the degree of awareness that a person had while he or she was sinning. So sometimes a person was is aware except that it's just not that convenient to follow the mitzvah at this moment. There are all kinds of excuses and so on. And sometimes it could be a person who has it out with HaKadosh Baruch Hu and he's violating a mitzvah just to show who's boss. So there are different levels of, yeah, of, of sins. <laughs> Chait, Avon, and Pesha. And because the, the Torah will use these three expressions, so the antidote come in three packages as well. And if you just remember from Musaf of Rosh Chodesh, by the way, which is Zman Kapara, Rosh Chodesh, as Rabbi Yudha Levi in the Kuzari points out, is 
is a type of monthly Rosh, of Yom Kippur. It's a junior Yom Kippur, which some traditionally fast the day before Rosh Chodesh, an Arab Rosh Chodesh, and it's called Yom Kippur Katan. And that's only because you cannot fast on, Yom, on Rosh Chodesh. But Rosh Chodesh itself is a miniature junior Yom Kippur, Zman Kapara Yilachem. So you have Lemchilat Chait, Leslichat Avon, Ulchapara Pasha. So you have Chait, Avon, and Pasha, and you have Slicha, Mechila, Slicha, and Kapara. We say this also in the Al Chait, Al Chait Shekatan Lufanecha, Al Chait Shekatan Lufanecha. Then we say, Ve'al Kulam, Eloh Slichot, Slach Lanu, Nechal Lanu, Kaper Lanu. All three expressions. Now we could be, we could do, we could say, okay, we understand this. So we say this in Shmon Esrei, in our davenings, all the davenings on Yom Kippur. By Titen Lanu Hashem Lakeinu, God has given us at Yom Kippurim Azeh Leslicha Lemchila Ulechapara. But the sentence does not end there. It continues by saying, Velimchol Bo Et Kol Avonotenu, and to atone for all the sins. So the Rav asked, so one second, if there was slicha and it was mechila and it was kapara, there's nothing left. Everything is gone. The, 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 the slate is clean. So the Rav said, yeah, your slate might be clean, but the next guy's slate may not be all that clean yet. And you have an obligation to see to it, v'limchol bo et kol avonotenu. You have, there's a collective obligation to guarantee that every single person participates in Yom Kippur. And that's why the Chazan will begin Yom Kippur by inviting everyone in, even those who perhaps we might not have ordinarily welcomed them to Shul. Anu matirim l'palel im ha'avaryanim. And if there are some people out there in the street not in Shul for Yom Kippur, then those who are in Shul should make another al khait It's our fault. We did not do enough to encourage them to be welcomed in shul on Yom Kippur. Many years ago, on the night before Erev Yom Kippur, on Israel TV News, so they did an item on preparing for Yom Kippur. So they took two scenes. One is they went to Me'a Sharim, and they were doing kaparot. That makes for good TV, with the chickens around the head, very nice. Very nice TV. And then after that was finished, the cameras moved to North Tel Aviv. North Tel Aviv is the bastion of secular life in Israel. And they went to a bike store. Now, a bike store was because the high school kids in secular world, and I'll specifically say Ashkenazi seculars, because Sephardi secular will come to Shul on Yom Kippur. The kids will come. They're very traditionally minded. But Ashkenazi, unfortunately, are not so. So whereas there's no traffic in Israel at all, the airport's closed, everything's closed. The only thing that might be on the road is, a, is an ambulance, and that's it. So um, it's a free reign for bicycle riders and, uh, and, and, and rollerblades. So these kids go to the bike stores to get their equipment patched up for Yom Kippur. And the reporter is in interviewing a 16-year-old and how is he preparing for Yom Kippur? And he bought this and he has this and he has the best of that. At the end, the reporter asks him, and will you be fasting on Yom Kippur? He says, Betach, it's a Yom Kippur. Of course, it's Yom Kippur. What do you think? Of course we're gonna fast. I think only in Eretz Israel you can get that kind of response. And if this 16 year old who's gonna be riding a rollerblade or a bike on the open highway in Yom Kippur didn't feel the need to show up in a Beit Knesset for something, then something's wrong. Then something is wrong. We have not completely absorbed the message of absorb the responsibility. So this is message number one of introducing Kol Nidre, the indispensability of the inclusion of all Jews. And then we come to the meat of what Kol Nidre is all about. And as it has it, I know that in my experience in years in education, I would ask certain questions and my students ultimately found out that there was a one word answer to every single question that I asked. It's a machloket, it's a dispute. There's no one opinion. There's always a dispute. So what is konedre? It's a machloket. Well, it originally entered into the Machzor of Yom Kippur 
approximately the 8th century, maybe the 9th century, the days of the Geonim of Bavel. And it was indeed a type of public annulment of vows. Now, annulment of vows, Hatarat Nedarim, is not, a, not necessarily Yom Kippur uh, subject. It's a subject throughout the year. Uh, it's mentioned in Parshat Matot. It's mentioned in other places in the Chomish. There's a whole tractate of, of Mishnah and Gemara called Masechet Nedarim and another one called Masechet Shvuot. Two big, large uh, uh, sections of Gemara that deal with oaths and vows and commitments and so on. And if a person made a vow and discovers that for whatever reasons cannot keep the vow, there are, there's a mechanism in halakha to annul the vow. And this is not tarat nedarim, and it's a shear in itself, more than one shear, believe me, on how hatarat nedarim functions. Now here, there was an attempt to have a public type of hatarat nedarim. That usually doesn't happen like this. Hatarat nedarim means you summon three people who are tamidei chachamim, you announce what your vow is, and they, taken into consideration, and they have the authority to annul the vow. But to have a chazan get up there with two people on a side and say, kol using all the halachic expressions of vows and, and promises and so on, and say, they are no longer there, they're no longer binding, push the delete button on, on all these vows and so on. The figuring was that many people made vows throughout the year, and did not go through the process of hatarat nedarim. So let's just get it in for everybody in a type of wholesale manner uh, before Yom Kippur begins. So this type of kol nidre had the phrase miyom kippurim she'avar ad yom kippurim zeh from last Yom Kippur until this Yom Kippur. If anybody made any vow or promise and so on. They are no longer uh, binding. Fine. The problem was that several generations later, the grandson of Rashi, who was Rabbeinu Tam, Rabbeinu Yaakov Ishtam, that was his official name, um, and he was called Rabbeinu Tam because of the Pasuk of Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov Ishtam Yoshev Oalim. The students affectionately and with great reverence, called them Rabbeinu Yaakov Ishtam. And with time, he became nicknamed Rabbeinu Tam. So Rabbeinu Tam believed that you cannot do an annulment of vows in such a wholesale manner, and uh, we, we cannot continue with this. However, Rabbeinu Tam understood that the Kol Nidre was already impacted into the Machzer, and he could not do away with it. So what he did was something very, very um, cute. He changed the tense of the Kol Nidre. And he says, you know what? Kol Nidre is not annulling vows for next year, but for, for the past year rather. But many times when we say we're going to do something, we've trained ourselves to say, Beli neder. Uh, don't hold me accountable in the laws of neder, of vows and so on. Now, sometimes we forget to say that. So here, Rabbeinu Tam says, the Chazan can get up and say, which vows? Till next year's Yom Kippur. So that's not a moment of vows. That's simply a public type of announcement that any vow that I will make in the coming year, it's Belineder. Make believe I said Belineder to all of them. So what you have is Rabbeinu Tam negating the whole idea of hatarat uh, nedarim, uh, of uh, annulling vows, and creating a new concept that has to do with projecting to the coming year that it should be bili neder. Now, some communities said it one way, and some communities said it the other way. But as we have it in the formation of minhagim, with the passing of time, sometimes different minhagim join together, even though they actually might be mutually exclusive. In this case, I wouldn't say it's mutually exclusive. I would just say that by saying, as all of us in Eretz Yisrael do today, and some in Chutz Laaretz, when I say all, I'm talking about the Sephardi and the Ashkenazi, found in the very popular Minat Yisrael Machzor that's used here in Israel. It says, Miyom Kippurim She'avar Ad Yom Kippurim Zeh, U Miyom Kippurim Zeh, Ad Yom Kippurim, Abba Leinu 
what we did was we took the version of the Geonim, Rav Hai Geon, and we took the version of Rabbeinu Tam and sandwiched them together. So neither of them, of them would have been happy, except they're not mutually exclusive. We can live with this and we can live with that. But the Rav did something very exciting with all this. And he said, you know why we have the Kol Nidre now? With having the factor of last year and the factor of next year built into the fabric of Kol Nidre, because it, it actually reflects the process of tshuva, of repentance. The Rambam in his first chapter and second chapter of the laws of tshuva deal with not only the fact that a person must necessarily leave the sin. You cannot do tshuva while you're still doing the sin. That's called tovel v'sheretz piado. You're going to the mikveh and you're holding the, the object that makes you impure right in the hand. You can't do that. Obviously, you have to leave the sin. But there's a process. And the process has to do with confession. You have to spell it out, what you did. But there are also two emotions that go along with this. One is regret and embarrassment. And the second is a type of declaration that tomorrow things will be better. What's known as charata al she'avar and kabbalah al atid. We have regret from what happened in the past and we now declare in the future will be better. We will do our utmost to be better. I'm just going to say parenthetically, uh, the great Rav Yudah Amital, the great Rosh Hashiva at Yeshiva Taratzion, once said and asked the question on Yom Kippur in a talk, so where do we have Kabbalah on the future? Charata, we have plenty of statements in the Machsah Yom Kippur that we feel awful, we feel terrible, we're embarrassed, that's there. But where do we have that we're going to be better next year? So at the end of every Shemun Esrei, it says, We make this little statement at the end of Shemun Esrei, it should be the will of God that I won't sin again. Rav Amital said, you're so honest on Yom Kippur, you don't even want to declare something that you may not be able to uh, keep it 100%. See, you're asking God, give me the strength that I should not sin once again. And it and, uh, should be held next year accountable. Not only did you do sins, but you're also a liar on Yom Kippur that you said you're not going to sin. So we say it in such a way that we diplomatically have the Kabbalah eh, al -hatid. So the Rav said, this is what is the nutshell of what Kol Nidre is today. It is something that reminds us about dealing with the past and dealing also with the future. So it's symbolic of the process of tshuva. Another, another idea, the Rav said, is that from all the various Averot in the Torah, you need Yom Kippur to, for God to atone. You sinned against God. In the area of annulling vows, this is an area that God gave Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, through the agency of Torah, the, um, the license to undo the problem. So you don't have to have a Kadosh Baruch Hu for Hatarat Nedarim. You are perfectly capable of doing this. So let's get it done right before Yom Kippur and show a Kadosh Baruch Hu that whatever we can do, we will do. Whatever we can't do, we beg God to, to help us. Now there's another area that we also uh, get involved before Yom Kippur. And that has to do with Social sins, Averot ben Adam Lachavero. The Mishnah says in the end of Masachet Yoma that Yom Kippur atones for sins between man and God. But sins between man and man, social Averot, it says, Ain Yom Kippur in Mechaper, Ache Yeratzebo Chavero. Yom Kippur will not atone until you beg forgiveness from the person. That, that doesn't mean Yom Kippur doesn't forgive. Yom Kippur does forgive, but you must take the first step in re repairing the damage that was created by saying a bad word against somebody, by perhaps taking something that doesn't belong to him, to you, whatever the issue may have been, you must take the first step and, re re and, and, uh, and repair the damage. And then 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu will step in and give you kapara, forgiveness also for the Ben Adam Lachaviro. But uh, at least there's another example where if you as a human being does not take, do not take the first step, then you cannot expect the Kadosh Baruch Hu to do this. The law branches out into many, many areas of human concern where he feels that it's true, we need a Kadosh Baruch Hu for so many things. However, there is also a, um, a, a, a human initiative that, that plays a major role. Most probably the, the one that came most to mind to the rub was health issues. Today we're dealing with a major health issue. You can daven and you should daven and we continue to daven for the health of each and every one of us. But that doesn't mean we should sit and twiddle our thumbs while the coronavirus is taking over the world. Human beings, there must be human initiative. There must be scientists, physicians, and, and the entire medical world galvanized together in order to attack the, uh, the uh, pandemic. And that is part of our mandate as well. The Ruff felt that this is, um, this is epitomized by Hatarat Nedarim before Yom Kippur. You do what you have to do. And this, by the way, was a big issue, even with regard to the Ruff's attitude um, uh, towards religious Zionism, where he did not uh, share the view of other great Torah giants, that we have to sit and wait till Mashiach comes, and then everything's going to work out, and so on. The Ruff felt that Am Yisrael has to move things along, and he really believed, deeply believed this as well. Another issue that the Ruff spoke about with regard to Kol Nidre had to do with the three people, um, with the two with the, the Chazan in the middle, and the two people, gentlemen, on his right and his left. Now, the Ruff said something interesting. Our custom in most synagogues is that this takes place only for Kol Nidre. And the minute the Kol Nidre part is done with the Sifreto brought back to the Aron Kodesh. They close the Aron Kodesh, people sit down. Usually the rabbi says a few words and they daven Mayrev. In Valozhin Yeshiva and in Brisk, the custom was that for many, many parts of the entire Yom Kippur davening, the Chazan was surrounded by two people. Now, normally we understand the two people by Kol Nidre because for a, if you entertain the view of Rav Hai Gaon, that this is genuine annulment of vows, you need a bait in, you need a court. The court is three. That's how it originated. But uh, in Valojan and in Brisk, they thought that there was another idea, and an idea that did not allow the uh, Chazan to remain unattended with someone on the right and the left until the end of Nila. And what was that reason? And the Rav looks at the end of Parshat Bishalach. The end of Parshat Bishalach, we have the war against Amalek. The war against Amalek, where Am Yisrael just recently left Mitzrayim, just recently went through the Yamsuf, just recently received uh, man from Shemayim, they received water. Things already happened in the desert that showed that a Kadosh Baruch Hu was on our side and so on, and miraculous exit from Mitzrayim. And all of a sudden, we're attacked from the rear. Attacked from the rear. We just read about the, the, the remembering part of this just the other week in Parshat Kitetse, which is the essence of Parshat Zohar before Purim, as you know. The, um, so what is Amalek? So, the Rob's grandfather pointed out once that if someone was looking for to do a new mitzvah, because the Rambam tells us in the laws of tshuva that from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, we should try to upgrade our mitzvah performance. Okay, so that doesn't mean that if a person loves his wife dearly, but he's looking for another mitzvah, and Gerushin, divorce of one's wife, is listed as one of the 613 mitzvot, that he should tell his wife, Hineni muhan and zuman the kayim mitzvah sasei shal Gerushin, after divorce my wife now before Yom Kippur, well, I'll remarry her maybe afterwards, and so on. That's nonsense. That's utter nonsense, because mitzvah doesn't mean a good thing, as, as we sometimes translate it in Yiddish, a mitzvah. Mitzvah means a command of God. 
And some of the commands of God deal with very, very difficult human situations because human beings are frail and human beings do damage and human beings have, have, have hard difficulty in relationships. And the Torah is there to govern all of these difficult issues. And if no Jew ever violated an issue of, 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 of repaying damages and so on, God won't hold him accountable. He's a tzaddik, and that's what we should all be. But these mitzvot are on the books, no doubt. The, um, the problem is that when a person um, trains himself by education, by practice, by following, to, to be a, a, a sensible, good person, there's still something in him that's perhaps a little bit um, sour. Not everything is 100% perfect. And the Rav went on to say that just as we have great hope in taking somebody who's very far removed from Torah observant life, and we think we've got a chance of bringing them back into the fold. Why? Because there's a concept called a pintal yid. There's a little yud, which is the word Jew in Yiddish. There's a trap, there's a pilot light that was never extinguished. And if you can just get that to ignite, you can bring a person closer. The Rav told me once that in Kiruv, you don't have to worry about 613 mitzvahs. Worry about one mitzvah at a time. Get the person to touch something that's holy and let the Torah do its job, do its magical work. And he quoted for me a pasuk called Hanugea Bamizbeach Yikdash. Just touching the Mizbeach gives a person a sense of holiness. And that's how Kiruv should work. And many of the Kiruv organizations actually work like that. They work on one mitzvah at a time and not the whole, the whole the 613, because then you're gonna really end up turning somebody off. You work a little bit at a time. But the Rav said, just like there's a pin to the yid in every person, and this was a hard thing to swallow, and I once said this in my shul in Ramot, and there was a woman who was very, very agitated by this comment. The Rav said that there's a pin to the amalek in every single person as well. Every person has something there that drives him to evil. Very minute, but it's something that we're constantly battling. And that battle takes place on Yom Kippur. We have to expunge the Amalek from within us. And because the war of Amalek in Parshat B'Shalach was Moshe, Aharon, and Chur. Moshe was the leader, and he had two subordinates on the side, Aharon and Hur. This was the classic scene of Am Yisrael going to war against Amalek. So too, so too, we have to have three people up there throughout the davening as a gesture of Muhammad Amalek. Now, that's a very, very interesting thought because the Rub once quoted his grandfather by saying that, and again, and this is what led me before to suggest if a person's looking for a mitzvah, person's looking for a mitzvah in the 10 days of tshuva to upgrade his mitzvah. So of course, you're not going to look at uh, Gerushin divorce, but you, you saw there's an mitzvah that to eradicate the seven nations of Canaan. Lot techayek kol neshama. Isn't that a wonderful mitzvah? So the Rambam says, don't bother because there are none left. Kvar avad zichram. They're just not there anymore. So it's the mitzvah still on the books, but there's nothing to be done any longer the seven nations of Canaan have been effectively eliminated. But then in the next line, the Rambam in the fifth chapter of Luchot Malachim talks about the war against Amalek, and he does not say, Kvar Avad Zichram. Why? The Rambam, the Rav, the Rav said, in the name of his grandfather, Rav Chaim Salavechik from Brisk, because Amalek is still here. Maybe not genealogical Amalek, but Amalek is a policy. The way it reads in the Megillah of Esther, Lashmid, Larog, Ulabed, et Kolayudim, Minar, Vatza, Kem, Tach, and Hashem, Yom Echad. Total annihilation of Am Yisrael in one time framework. That is what Amalek is. So there are Amalekim out there, unfortunately. We know that. We, we, history, Jewish history is replete with examples of such Amalekim. But the Rav went on to say that 
there's a pintle amalek in each and every one of us, and we have to deal with it on Yom Kippur, and hence on giving some understanding to the custom of being surrounded by all three, uh, uh, by three, the chazan is surrounded by two other people, forming Moshe, Aaron, and Chor. And the last point was a most dramatic, climactic ending to a tshuva drasha back in 1971. It was Tavshin Lamedet. And you have to realize, we were sitting there from eight o'clock and this drama began to unfold at about 11.30, 20 to 12. The Rav had dealt with the issue of tshuva and how it relates somehow as an analogy to Hatarat Nedarim. There are two ways the halacha allows for a neder, a promise, a vow to be annulled. One is called charata, that the person regrets, he tells the three gentlemen, dayanim, rabbanim, that he regrets the, the, uh, the, what, the, what he said. He says, I just, I'm in a different mindset now. I'm in a different mood now. In this state of mind, I would never have made that uh, vow, and he wants to get out of it. The other is called petach. Petach means an opening. An opening. You're trying to figure out that if the scenario was such, if you would have been aware of all kinds of ramifications of what you did because of your nether, would you have pronounced the nether in the first place? And if the dayanim are convinced that you would not have, they are allowing you to annul the, or they will use their authority, best of them, to annul the neder on the basis of this etach, this opening. And the Rav took those two different types of methods of hatarat nedarim, annulling a vows, and he posited it against tshuva, the emotional tshuva and the more intellectual tshuva. Because the Rav felt that, the Rav felt that not everybody comes back to Kadosh Baruch on the same route. Some are drawn emotionally, and some, they may be very cold emotionally, but they fought it out. And, um, and that's how the, Ramb- the Rav resolved a difficulty in the Rambam, that once he talks about the charata, the regret, and only afterwards the declaration in the future, and then the next source, he does it just the other way around. He talks about the declaration in the future, and then talks about the regret. And, and the Rav felt that the Rambam was alluding to do two different types of bale tshuva. One was the emotional, and one was more the intellectual, and he related it to the two phases of, or modes, of hatarat nadarim. After he goes through this whole lengthy, lengthy, the Rav says as follows. We are going to enter Yom Kippur now, and Yom Kippur is, the theme of Yom Kippur is one pasuk, in Parshat Emor, Ki bayom hazeh yichaper alechem letaher etchem mikol chatotechem lefnei Hashem titaru. And on this day, and the Rav always said, it's not on this day. He said, it's through this day. But to use the Rambam's expression, the itzumo shel Yom HaKippurim, the essence of Yom Kippur. Using the essence of Yom Kippur, God will forgive. Forgiveness and purity are two things. It's a share in itself. All sins. Nothing's left out in the cold. Standing before God and receiving that moment of purity. How do you stand before God? We're not in the Beit HaMikdash. Beit HaMikdash, there was an element of Lufnei Hashem. We're just wherever we are. You can be in Toronto, you can be in Los Angeles, you can be in New York, you can be in Tel Aviv, in Eilat, in Yerushalayim, at the Kotel. We're not, we may be a little closer in Yerushalayim. That's the honest truth, a little closer. But there's no Beit HaMikdash. So you don't have the absolute Lufnei Hashem yet. However, there is Lufnei Hashem Titanu even without Beit HaMikdash, even without Eretz Yisrael. How do you do it? So the Rav said, look, we all have responsibilities in life. And these responsibilities, the Rav said, are very, very legitimate. 
We have responsibilities to our families. We have responsibilities to ourselves. We have responsibilities to our place of employment. We have responsibilities to our community. We have responsibility to our shul. We have responsibility to the various organizations that we belong to. We have responsibilities. And these responsibilities, they take our time, they take some of our money, they take, we, 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 we spend. And we, we, we are willing to do it because these are all important, extremely, extremely important endeavors. And without it, what would life be already? And the Rav said on Yom Kippur, you have to take all of those legitimate responsibilities and put them all on the sideline. They have no place if you want to stand Lifnei Hashem Titaro. They must be on the sideline. So the chazan gets up and he says, and I'm going to try just to imitate some of that drama. And the Rav barked out the Kol Nidre, each representing a different aspect of human responsibility, legitimate human responsibilities. But on the night of Yom Kippur, they are all put on the side. Nothing is important. Nothing, nothing, nothing is important. The only thing that matters is Lifnei Hashem Titaru. And you know, the original Minag was, and there were many people in Europe who did this, and a handful of people in the modern age who still do this, do not leave the shul on Yom Kippur from Kol Nidre until after Mairav of Nila, after Nila. Never leave the shul. They stay in the shul with a kittle, and they say, till him at night, and they, um, they study the Mishnah or the Gemara Masechet Yoma, and they study the Avoda. They, they're there. They're there all night, all night. And they do not leave the presence of what's been established with Nei Hashem. And the Rav said, that is why the uh, davenings that normally end with Aleinu L'Shabeach, and Aleinu L'Shabeach, some people in a humoristic note gave Aleinu L'Shabeach a nickname, Tfilat HaDerech, because you have one foot out the shoe when you're leaving and saying Alein Mulushabeach. But you ever notice there's no Alein Mulushabeach after Shacharit on Shabbat? And there's no Alein Mulushabeach sh after Shacharit on Yom Tov or Rosh Chodesh or any day for that matter that there's a Musaf? The reason is because you're not leaving standing in front of the Shekhinah, standing in front of God. You're going right into the next Fila. And on Yom Kippur, there's no Alein Mulushabeach after Shacharit. There's no Alein L'Shabeach after Musaf because our Chachamim never heard of a break between Musaf and Mincha. People went from Musaf right into Mincha. There's no Alein L'Shabeach after Mincha and there's no Alein L'Shabeach after Nila because they went right into Mairif of Motzei Yom Kippur. And the Alein L'Shabeach was at night. The only Alein L'Shabeach that makes it into the master is the night of Kol Nidre because many people leave shul and that's why we say Aleinu L'Shabeach. But people in my shul uh, have asked me, so maybe we should say Aleinu L'Shabeach after Musaf if we have a two-hour break, there's something to it. But the Rav taught us many years ago not to alter the machzer in any way or manner. But there was, the, the person had a point. He really had a point. But the Rav said, why is this so? It's not just accidental that, you know, Musaf comes after Shacharit and Mincha comes after Musaf and Nila comes after Mincha. But he said that this is what we say right after Mairav on Kol Nidre night. Ya'ale tachnuneinu me'erev v'yavo rinuneinu shavateinu mipoker v'yera'er rinuneinu ad erev. The Paitan, the poet, had a pasuk in front of his eyes. Erev ad Erev tishpetu shabbatrem. Yom Kippur is from the evening to the evening. And hence the poet writes, our tefillah starts now in the evening and continues in the morning and continues uninterrupted until the evening. 
יעלה תחנוננו מערב, ויבוא שבתנו מבוקר, ויראה חינוננו עד ערב. And you leave that מילה with a sensation that you had לפני השם תתארו, for all, for the entire day, there is good reason to leave בשמחה, with great joy, that Kadosh Baruch Hu has accepted our tefillot, and the tefillot of all of Kala Yisrael, that Kadosh Baruch Hu should indeed give us a bracha of Ruf Wa'ashlema, and um, it should be b'sarot tovot for all of us. Erev Tov. From Yerushalayim. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, putting us in the mood for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, which we all know is going to be a very, very different uh, Yamim Noraim this year. If anybody's any questions, you want to put them in? I think yes, there are uh, one. I have a question. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, be quest I'll be staying in front of Hashem from uh, Cleve uh, Shaker Heights, Ohio, a phenomenal shir, Rabbi, uh, just wonderful. My question okay. is, to what extent does the, um, the, the, uh, are the emotional components of tshuva uh, important? You talked about those who can do so logically, but what about the emotional part of it? Could you comment on how important that is? Should there obviously be both? Uh, I, I welcome your comment. Okay, so, so first of all, there's no question there should be both, but the balance is very, very personal. The Rav himself struggled with the, with the part of the emotion. He said he had a much easier time talking about the intellect, giving over material, explaining it, analyzing it. With emotion, um, there's no question that the Torah speaks about commitment that involves emotion. Um, you take the, um, the mitzvah that we're going to read about this coming Shabbat in Vayelech of writing a Sefer Torah, which is number 613 in the listing of Tariyag Mitzvot, the Torah gives itself a nickname called Shira, song and poetry. Which means that Torah, it's not only supposed to be an intellectual exercise, but it should also be something that's emotional, that has rhythm, and, um, and because of that, people will perceive their closeness to God in different ways, and there is no um, um, gauge that can monitor that closeness. It is highly, highly personal, highly personal. And, um, and we have to understand that that is not just equally legitimate, it's legitimate. And, you know, to say that a person should have this or that, that I wouldn't say, but there's a balance and every person will find himself or herself within the world of that balance. Okay, thank you. Before, if anybody's question, I just want to mention, uh, well, the phone rings here in the background, I'm sorry, otherwise I'd mute myself, but um, tomorrow morning, we're gonna move, I guess, from the intellectual to the emotional a little bit. And Chazan Malavani, one of the top Chazanim in the world, Joseph Malavani, will be giving a four-part series on um, Nusach HaTfilah. He will be singing a little bit and explaining how the tunes, the modes, and the Mamish Nusach, you know, HaMelech, you know, uh, whatever, explain and how, um, you know, how important it is to understanding our Tfilah. So I really welcome everybody. Um, that's tomorrow morning at 11. Wednesday morning at 11, Yehuda Mirsky will start a three-part series on Shuvah in Rav Kook. One of the talked about Rav Soloveitchik and Rav Cook are the two people you think of when you think on, on Shuva. Thursday morning, Alex Israel can, can use his, ser, his series. Um, Menachem League Tag Saturday night, a priest league with Shear at, at 10 30 Eastern. He told me he's happy to get up at 5 in the morning anyway, so it'll be 5 30 in Israel um, on the Yud Gimel Midot, which of course is the main focus of Slichot. And next week we'll have a few additional Shearim coming online. So uh, welcome everybody. This evening, Mark Shapiro will be continuing his regular classes regular Monday night class. So I just want to let everybody know if anybody has any Shireem, 